Um, I'm going to be kind of in charge of things. My name's Hannah Tinty. I'm so happy to be the Center for Fiction. I've actually done tons of events um, at the Old Space um, in Midtown, but it's so nice to be in Brooklyn and only you know a 20-minute walk away from where I live. So that is delightful, <laughs> um, and I'm really happy all of you guys are here as well. So I'm going to just start by just talking about selected shorts. Um, how many people here have actually been to selected shorts before? I'd say about half. Or how many have listened to it on the radio? Yeah, about half. OK, so for, the, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with selected shorts, I'm going to tell you how, how it began. Um, and it all started in, in 1984, a long time ago. Um, so Kay Catarula had this idea about actors performing short stories on stage. And she brought that idea to Isaiah Sheffer, um, who is, uh, you know, was the Symphony Spaces co-founder and co-artistic director, and that their first literature in performance uh, program began in 1985. And then it expanded into a public radio program, which is on 130 different stations, um, a podcast, um, you know, and you know, it's just sort of like blossomed. Into, also, they do um, they they go on tour. They do things in LA. They you know they they just bring actors and literature together, and it's really exciting because as actor, I mean, as writers, we're like, you know. I don't know, introverts who like don't really talk to people, and then we like get to go to symphony space and meet like, you know, Sigourney Weaver or something, and kind of lose <laughs> our minds like reading our reading our pieces, and it's just like it's like this cool thing where they like bring the star power and we bring the writing power, and it's just kind of like <laughs> ah, it's just amazing. So um, the reason why I am here and and talking is because from 2010 to 2013. I was on the radio program and worked with Isaiah and Kathy Minton and, uh, and Sarah Montague to put together that show. Um, officially, my title was, uh, was, I think, literary commentator, but my real title was Isaiah's sidekick. Um, so I just sort of like, you know, he would talk and I'd be like, da da da, like on the side, um, you know, doing my little thing. Um, but we got a chance to interview writers about the work, um, interview actors about performing those pieces. And um, we even did some stuff on stage together. So it was, it, was, it was a really important time of my life. And so when Jennifer called me you know, up or sent me an email, because it was at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, asking me to um, help put this book together, which was really a celebration um, of 35 years of Selected Shorts. So they've been doing this program for 35 years. Um, they've just done so much for literature, so much for writers, you know, bringing stories, you know, alive, um, and that's what happened. So, Small Odyssey is, is an anthology. Um, the 35 stories uh, written by 35 different writers were all commissioned to be written specifically uh, for selected shorts, um, and we've got three of the writers here today. So. Um, uh, oh, one thing I did want to mention is on March 26th at Symphony Space, that's going to be like the super big launch with all the actors <laughs> involved. Um, it's an all-day event. It's called Wall to Wall Selected Shorts. It starts at 11 a.m. and goes until 11 p.m. It is free. It is also going to be broadcast all day. Um, and you can sort of wander in, wander out. It's going to be doing like two hour different sessions. There's going to be commissioned piece, pieces by filmmakers, by dancers, um, you know, opera singers, uh, visual artists uh, based on the pieces of the book. Um, and you'll get to see actors like Tony Shalhoub and Cynthia Nixon and Anika Noni Rose and Hugh Dancy, Sonia Manzano. Like so many favorites are all going to be there. So I hope you all will join us on March 26th. But, um, oh, and the final thing I want to announce is. Uh, um, selected shorts after many years and many sort of iterations, iterations? Iterations. iterations. <laughs> um, now has a new host, and that host is Meg Willitzer. Oh. And Meg Willitzer is not only a lot of fun um, and an amazing writer, but she also has an extraordinary singing voice. So I am really hoping that she brings back the like singing at the intermission, which Isaiah used to do back in the day. Um, we'll see if we can talk her into that. But so look forward to Meg Willister, who will also be there at Wall to Wall. But um, let's, you know, let's get to the fiction. I've yeah. done too much of a preamble already. Um, and what I wanted, I thought just we'd start, um, the, the organization of the book, we're calling it Small Odysseys. And that we, we were trying to think, when I read all 35 of the stories, I was trying to think of um, how do I organize these so that they actually make sense? And 
uh, we talked it all, all out and decided that probably the best thing, it really is this idea of a journey. Like the same way that a, a work of fiction, I feel like what happens is, you know, reading is kind of like an expedition. You know, you meet the author on the page and then you sort of step into this fictional world together. And so what I did was, you know, as I read through the stories, and even though they're so different, um, I realized that they're sort of, I sort of saw them as like, you know, beginnings, middle, and ends. Um, but the truth of the matter is it sort of, I changed it into departures, journeys, and new worlds. So, you know, the first step of any adventure is that departure. You know, it's leaving the known world and uh, leaving home saying goodbye. And then journeys is sort of all those stories are sort of about people in transition or movement or going from one place to another. And then new worlds, the, the third of the book is about arrival, sort of those strange and exciting first steps into unfamiliar territory. And the three writers we have tonight are actually all in the first section, which is departures. Um, so it's all about sort of separations, goodbyes, you know, cleaning out the old to start something new, which I feel like we are all kind of in that mental space right now. <laughs> um, just to get like a flavor of, you know, the different voices, I wanted to start by, you know, actually going down the line and having each of you read just like a tiny little beginning of, um, of the piece. So, Jai, do you want to get us started? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, does everybody have a copy? <laughs> no, wait, I have one more. It's all out. Here we go, pass that down. Okay. okay. There we go. We're keeping it casual up here. At the end of the show, we've all touched it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's copy. true. Um, so you want to, oh, here we go. Oh, sure. Oh, issues with the mic. Oh, with the mic. Okay. Oh, I get the fancy mic. It might just be yours. Is it just the one mic or all mics? Just his mic. Just, just my okay. mic. Okay. okay, I get the fancy. <laughs> all right, maybe I will sing. Yeah, okay, um, there we go. Lessons with Father. I wanted to know something about my father's art, though by then he was already dying. His last days were as simply weaved as any of the days after my mother had passed. And I'd come to his house to assume his care which meant, as I remember it now, two things, cooking a lentil and tomato soup that would last him several meals and replenishing his supply of comics, Tintin, and another series that was surely inspired by Melville because for years the same crew had been adrift at sea, searching for an island that would give them power and a reason for having devoted their lives to the search. Thank you. Waiki, can you read the start of yours? I'm going to find the page. Uh, oh, I have it marked in mine. I was, I'm going to tell you what page it. it is. Wait, no, you no, are 70, page 70. Okay, I got it. So do I? No, I don't use that. I don't. I don't okay. Um, the story is called iPhone SE. And I wrote it because I was having a really terrible relationship with my iPhone at that time. <laughs> I didn't know what SE stood for, but I liked the size. The phone could fit in the palm of my hand, and my fingers could still fold around it. I can't say that for the 6S or any of the later models. When my good friend still had the 11, I couldn't get a good grip, so I dropped it by accident on her new wood floors, which created a scratch. We both stared at the scratch and rushed to rub it out. Nothing came out, obviously. The scratch is still there. SE stands for a special edition and came in a pretty new color, rose gold. So mine, uh, um, ooh, a chair oh, arrives. I had done things at Symphony Space a million times, and, and so I, I was thinking a lot about the neighborhood around Symphony Space, and, yeah. and the request was also that the stories be pretty New York-centric, I think, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. So mine is called Goodbye to the Road Not Taken, mm. and it kind of goes like this. Meet me by the Fisher King, where? Near the deli that closed, it's near the place we used to go. The first place or the second place? It depends on how you define it. What will you be wearing, he asked. It's not that kind of meeting, she says. If you're not on one corner, you'll be on the other. Even from across the street, I'll see you. It's not like I don't know who you are. I have an umbrella, he says. These days I always have an umbrella. I like to be prepared. And I discovered it has many uses, almost like one of those utility tools, like a pocket knife. Two days pass. So here we are, he says. Imagine that, me bumping into you here on this corner, where in the past we spent so much time waiting for the lights to change. You didn't bump into me. We made a time to meet so I could give you your mail. Why do you turn fact into fiction? He shrugs. Polite conversation? And by the way, why this corner, not the usual? 
Oh, he says, knowing exactly what she's talking about. I don't go there anymore. His tone implies that whatever happened there was so bad he hasn't shaken it off. What do you mean you don't go there anymore? That was your place. You went there every day. It was like a religious event. She could go on, but he cuts her off. I got into a fight with the guy. A fight? You don't fight with anyone. What was it about? Who was next in line? And like that, you just stopped going? I did, he says proudly. He let someone cut the line, so I stopped going. I wanted to show myself that I could be definitive. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to all three of those. It was really, really great. Uh, so, so one of the things that we decided to do in the book was to ask each author to write an author's note afterwards, which I, I really love because it gives you this sort of peek behind the curtain into the creative process. And, um, and each of you contributed really great little notes. I, I loved reading them. It's funny because I actually had read all the stories you know, and, and gotten to know them before this. Um, and, then, um, and then reading your notes was, was really, really cool. And, and AM, I know that you started with the idea of the neighborhood around Symphony Space, but also um, the Frost poem. Yes. So, well, yes. It, it, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so, yes. So, 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 like, did you, so you had that in your mind when you began? I don't know, Hannah, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, what would Robert Frost do at a moment like this? Yeah. <laughs> a pandemic is upon us. And, um, I think if I remember correctly, the, yeah, I was thinking about the Frost problem because I, like, I think that idea of the road not taken, right? What is yeah. that? And, and it turns out it was started kind of as a, it was a joke. It was a, a relationship to another poet and something he was saying. But yeah, and I also was, I've always, I want to say, wasn't Frost wrote the poem for JFK's inauguration? Wasn't that the last time he read in public? It was 1961. So there's, you know, I was working on my novel. <laughs> you'll see. Anyway, I have no, I can't tell you anything more than that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's great, because I, I think this is like, this is a, and I, I want to ask, um, Jai, I want to ask you as well, because your piece was also inspired by a poem. Yeah. What poem was yours? It was Derek Walcott's Love After Love. Love After Love. Yeah, it's so funny to have, uh, using this mic here, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorite poems. I came into writing f fiction from poetry, so I feel like so many of my fiction influences are poems that I can kind of track back to. Um, but I was thinking about Second Lives. It's about a music teacher who pursues visual art, and to me that feels like a love after love, to fall in love with music, and then later on you decide there's this whole new world out there which is painting in her, in this case, for the character, you know? So that's kind of like, yeah, that held true for me. Yeah, and these are like, what's interesting about each of these pieces, even though they are so different and you could hear them when they were reading their, reading their sections, it's like, you know, AMS is about end up two people who end up taking different roads, right? A relationship, like a romantic relationship that ends up splitting, you know, mm -hmm. where, where Jai's ends up being like a father and daughter saying goodbye, right? Where somebody is, is at the end of their life. Um, but Waikiki, year is like a different take on departures because it's really about, and yeah. I actually think it's about technology. Right. It's about like East versus West, right? It's about math, which I, which I love uh, that, you, that you have. But it's, it's about this thing of, of basically getting rid of your old iPhone for a new iPhone. What yeah. happens to the old iPhone like if they're sort of sentient and like, you know, and like feeling sad about being abandoned, which I always actually feel bad about my old yeah. phones. I actually have a stash. Oh, yeah. Keep my, them all? Not all of them, but like there's a few that like I have like really old ones that I have like sentimental right, right. like feelings about that I haven't I just, gotten rid I of. I have trouble getting rid of them because I, you know, I think about the battery, I think about it leaking into the soil, so I just keep all of them, right? And this, like, covered and you know the screen's all cracked and yeah the story's about math because at that time so I do a lot of you know STEM teaching and you know there's this thing I came across in this article about like the nine chapters of math and like China and you know none of the theorems are named um, it's just nine chapters of math and problems um, and I just thought about that in comparison to how individualistic you know, Western math is like everyone here hopefully knows what the Pythagorean theorem is. At least I've heard of it, right? Like every theorem is named for like the person that discovered it. But these chapters are just all how you figure it out, but there's no name attached to it. So I thought, well, that's a little, you know, it's East versus West. And then I thought, what if we had this like iPhone that just terrorized its owner in terms of <laughs> trying to force it to study math because, <laughs> right? This is my biggest fear in my childhood. So, <laughs> so I, I thought, feel like most not, writers, it's our biggest fear, right? Why not employ yeah. that into the phone and she just can't let it go, right? Because it's this like voice being like, I'm teaching you something and you know, she can't shut off 
Siri, and that happens, right? Siri just pops up, and you don't know why. Yeah, it's it's really fun. It's yeah. such a fun. Like I read this, I was like, this is I've never like it was one of those things like I had never thought of before. When I read it, it, was like, but it felt like I but I feel like it had been in my head before, <laughs> like that whole idea of it. I'd love to ask each of you, you know, let's have like a, like a conversation about what was it like to write a piece knowing it was going to be performed. Like, did you approach it in a different mm -hmm. way, or or um, did you think about it? Like, how is this going to be when someone reads it? You know, I think that you did by you having a lot of dialogue in yours, Anne. Yeah, but I always have that. I yeah. Like, nope, it didn't occur to me. It was going to be did you not think about it at all? No, honestly, was, no. Was, no. And now, and I never I thought until you said that just now. I'm like, nope. <laughs> were, were, you, were you all just thinking, oh God, I got to make this deadline? Or is that was that what was going on? No, because you know the deadline didn't it keep getting pushed out. I don't remember, but it felt like, oh, it, was like it was like, do you think you could do this by like whatever you know, 1984? And then all of a sudden I was like, do you think you could do it by you know? Uh, and then yeah, so I don't know. Wasn't the deadline? Didn't it turn it did into get, a liquid like other things did? You, you know, <laughs> I, I've got to tell you, like you know, like the pandemic hitting like made all deadlines in everyone's lives, you know, and, and I will say uh, it was hilarious because I mean, I, I'm used to this because like I'm a, both a writer and an editor. Yeah. And it's just so, so funny, like the, the excuses that 35 different writers can come yeah, up with funny. to like not turn in on time <laughs> is hilarious. Um, My cat ate someone else's cat. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it just keeps going. Yeah. It just keeps going. So, so, so was that, so it was, I guess it wasn't a factor for anybody. That's so interesting. To well, I, I wrote in the first person which yes. I almost never do in my writing. You know, I feel like the third person is just my jam. I feel like that's, for me, you know, I feel like that's the most versatile point of view. No offense to any writers who disagree. Um, but I was like, you know, I'm gonna do a first person point of view story just to have, have some fun. And maybe, maybe that was influenced by the fact that I knew it was gonna be at some point read out loud. Yeah. Did you think about it, Waiki, at all? Not really, Not but, really. But, but you know, I think it was just a really fun piece that I knew it was going to be short, I knew I could kind of just have fun with it. Um, it was a good break from my novel, which at that time was pretty depressing, because um, I was rewriting it. Um, and it was just like a nice escape that I just thought, well, what would be you know fun to read for right, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Yeah. I know that... I know that uh, Waiki, have you had your work performed at Symphony Space? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So right. all three of you have your have had your yeah. stuff performed on selection shows before. What? And I have also. So I want to talk about that. Like, what is that experience like when you're sitting in the audience? Like for me, it was very strange the strange. first time it happened. Like you know, having because usually I'm the person up there reading my work. So like having someone do a different interpretation of it was like was kind of. Like the first time it happened to me, it was like very strange, and I was like, I don't know if I like that. The second time, the second second time it happened, Laurie Anderson was doing it, and oh I was God. like, <gasps> I was like, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. Like that's how I felt the whole time. How about you guys? What was it like? I say I want to hear Laurie's reading of your story. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, is it on the? Is it where? Where does? Where do people find? I think it's. I think it's on one of the compilations. Are there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On one of the compilations. Because it was the the one that I was in. That was that one. That one was a uh, was a was a thing about music. So what they did was have we had to write. It was it was based off of an anthology I was involved in called Lit Riffs, mm. which we had to write a piece based on a piece of music. And I did it on Milestones, uh, Milestones by Miles Davis. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was they had the person would read the piece, and then they had a band perform the music. Wow. Like right, right. You know, sort of in, in compilation. Yeah. So it was. So it was. So it was that. Yeah. But yeah, I'll find. I'll find it. I'll get it to you. It was good. Yeah. Uh, but so. But but what was it like when so, you were in okay, the audience? There's there's the funny version, which I'll tell you first, which is that. <laughs> so I've had it. My story's read there several times, and I would say, it's terrifying and surrealistic. But then the last time I had it, a story read there, Jane Curtin read the story, and the weirder thing was I once had, or the point is I would say I once had, or I thought I had, like did it really happen? Dinner in Los Angeles. James, Jane Curtin, Samuel L. Jackson, and Judge Judy, okay? Oh, so, yeah. Wait, was this I, a dream or well, it's no, reality? So, this, so I'm always like, I always look back on it. I think, did I have dinner once with Judge <laughs> Judy, Samuel L. Jackson, and Jane Curtin, and Judge Judy, and Samuel L. Jackson were like talking about New York real estate prices. <laughs> in Los Angeles, like it sounds like a thing. So the last time backstage, Jane, oh, I hadn't seen Jane Curtin, and like Jane Curtin's Jane Curtin, right? She's, you know, Saturday Night Live, whatever, and she goes, do you remember that dinner? <laughs> <laughs> it happened. It actually happened. It happened. Yeah. So that is. So I would say just surreal is the whole. That's my word for the whole thing. But wow. I was comforted by the fact that it wasn't like a hallucination or some weird thing that I'd made up. 
because I've been telling people about it. Everyone's like, that makes no sense. I'm like, I know. <laughs> that is great. Well, that, din that dinner happened? It did happen. Well, yes. what did, what did, what did, God, I wish what I was at that dinner. What did Samuel have to say about the real estate prices? The prices were going up. And it was a long time ago. And he, and, and he and Judy were investing, and the rest of us were like, I wish I could. Oh, you know? uh, <laughs> all right, how, how much were you guys? What was, um, it, what was it like when you were in well, the audience? I, I think it was a little terrifying. Only, that's only happened to me once. I was sitting next to Mona Simpson, and it was, you know, um, I thought it would be relaxing because you get read to, but I just spent the whole time <laughs> staring at my lap because I was like, just I was just terrified, right? I, I don't know, it's just weird having someone read your work well so well, and then and then you're 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 there listening to people laugh or not laugh, and then you think, well, they should have laughed then, but they. That's didn't. what they I didn't remember laugh. the first time. Yes. I was yeah. like, yeah. why aren't they laughing? Yeah. yeah, and then they laugh at places where you're like, that wasn't supposed to be funny. Right. <laughs> For me, it was strange to be an observer yes. instead of like when I'm on stage, I'm terrified, you know, and sweating bullets, and so like, and I'm so like in the zone that like I can kind of hear when people laugh or whatever, but like I kind of I'm having my own experience. Out, yeah. But like being in the audience, I was like, I wasn't looking at the person performing. Yeah. I was just like, <laughs> what are they doing? Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 a, it's a fun thing, but I think that's actually one of the cool experiences right. of selected shorts, you know, of that, and then and then when it's on the radio, it's like oh, it's a whole other thing. Yeah. yeah. So Jai, how about you, for you? I, th I think hallucinatory is the word that I would go with as well, because like, I don't know, like I feel like with uh, that story that was read, I had so many drafts of it, Ooh. and I could imagine all the different lines that were read, and I was like, oh, is that the line that ended up in the final draft? <laughs> and also, uh, I want to share that I am the unfunniest writer in the world. Um, but, you know, when it was performed live by Bhavish Patel, you know, like he really brought humor out in places that I did not expect, which was just really lovely. That's great. Um, that's, that's fantastic. And this, I actually want to bring up, um, in about like, you know, five or ten minutes, we're going to open it, this up for questions. And um, the first person who asks a question, so in other words, the first hand is up. I don't know how we're going to do this. We're going to have to have some sort of like... Spotter, spotter, or like somebody. Somebody's gonna have to be the decider. Jennifer, you're gonna be this. You're gonna be the decider. Uh, is, is, whoever raises their hand first, or maybe we have a better view. So maybe, maybe on AM, I'll make you the. I'll make you the judge. Uh, the first person. What, what's basically, gonna happen to the person? They're gonna win a prize. <laughs> they're gonna win a prize. They're gonna get a copy of the book signed by all of us. Oh. Now it's like Jeopardy. They're all gonna be like, no, no. no. Uh, it'll, it'll be good. No, I, I'll do it like a one, two, three. But anyway, I just want to give you a warning because now you have like five minutes to think of a good question. Right? And then we'll like have we'll open for prizes, and then the first person will win a prize. But also, That's if anyone's go. disabled and can't raise their hand, let us know now. <laughs> so we have an alternate signaling system. <laughs> so we'll come up with something. We'll come up with something. But I just want to give you so anyway. So think about a good question because we're gonna open up for questions soon. So. The other thing I want to ask you is we, we, this is, you know, the Center for Fiction is a place for writers, right? It is a home for writers. There's a lot of people who, who have desks here or who work here in the cafe or go upstairs or, or, or you know, so, so we've got people who are probably logging in or people in the audience who are writers themselves. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Like if you had, you know, you, everybody on this stage has got accomplishments. Everybody on this stage is like, you know, won prizes and, when war is in, like you're on the other side. Although you, we all know that even, even though you know you've got that, that doesn't actually mean anything when you sit down at the desk. Right? It's still really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that personally, for me, like the pandemic has just made everything like been a big sinkhole. You mm -hmm. know, and it's been really, mm -hmm. really hard to kind of feel like with the world the way it is and, 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 and just the news and just like every day and just like all the things I feel like I should be involved in or, or you know, protesting against or, or doing something. It's just like it's overwhelming. And you, then you just start feeling like, well, why does this matter? Like mm -hmm. this little story that I'm taking out, like, you know, how, how and then, then you just, it's just like, you, it's really hard to keep going. So um, I actually like just did a, it did a did a class on this, which which was all about like exactly facing this issue, which I think everybody is sort of facing right now. So, um, so I, I I'll share a piece of advice that I got from Ruth Ozeki, which was great in one of the conversations that I had. 
Um, and she, her advice was to lower the bar so low <laughs> to like basically make it impossible not to step over. <laughs> so whatever you think, like you know, your goal is to I don't know, 500 words a day or a thousand yeah. words a day or whatever. Yeah. She's like lower it to like a hundred words a day. If that's too much, like literally like 50 words a day. <laughs> like make it so ridiculous to not step over that that's so that you don't have the barrier, right? Because I think like what we do is we end up putting higher expectations on ourselves right. and higher expectations on ourselves. So that's my advice. Lower the bar to the ground. And I have been applying that not just to my writing, but to every area of my life. Like, I'm going to the, I'm going to like that sink full of dishes. I'm like, I'll wash one mug. Like, that's, I'm lowering the bar. That's like all I'm doing to just make it through the day. So, um, so do you have a piece of writing advice that you could share mm -hmm. with uh, some of these aspiring writers? And especially like given our times. Anybody got some thoughts on that? Well, I think patience, patience. I, I'm not a very patient person. My husband's here, he can attest to that. Um, but but like, I think with, with writing, I learned how to be really, really patient with just, just waiting it out in terms of like, you know, like you said, this day went bad. I got two words out, right? And then I deleted it the next day. So then um, kind of being very patient with it the next day and the next day um, and just, not having a deadline is really helpful. But you know, as a teacher, I have to give deadlines. But then in real life, when you're working and writing, <laughs> there's like no real deadline. You just have to finish the project. So I think it gets done when it gets done. And then you just sort of let it go when that happens. You know? Yeah. So patience with yourself. Yeah. You like sometimes, yeah. you know, I, I'm like a very kind of like type A person. And I'm like, I'm going to get this done in two weeks. And like, it just doesn't happen. I don't have the ideas. And, it sucks and then you know you have to wait for a lot of things to kind of come together but like with a lot of other things you know you can say I'm gonna get this done in two weeks and it does it does have to happen um, so so I think with writing it was just moving the deadline to wherever it's you know whenever it's done it's done so that's good you got any thoughts yeah, my, my advice is to use only five-letter words in your fiction so that you can prepare for a wordle the next day. Um, that's what it's about, really. Um, but as I was coming here, I was listening to an interview with uh, Kate DiCamillo, the children's author, and, um, you know, like, this is totally her advice, but it just resonated with me, which is, like, to tell the truth but to make it bearable. And I feel like that's maybe the goal of you know writing fiction because there is so much sadness and darkness, especially in this moment. And so how can we be honest about that, but present it in a way that's compassionate and, mm -hmm. and brings out each other's humanity, brings out our humanity. That's beautiful. How's your Wordle streak? Did you get today's? Mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to brag about it. Would you? How, how, <laughs> oh, I suck at Wordle. Wordle what, you, what was your streak yeah. today? I, I didn't do. I didn't do today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I still have not done it. <laughs> I still have not done it. How and many wordles are out there? Yeah. <laughs> there's some. There's some. There's a few. Yeah. Um, How about you, Am? Yeah. My advice. My advice. Um, well, number one is it is it Adele who says hello from the other side? <laughs> you know, uh, no. Uh, the the wonderful writer Grace Paley, who was a teacher of mine, used to talk about how uh -huh. writing was one of those jobs where you never got promoted. You never became the senior vice president of adjectives. You never became <laughs> head of short stories. You know, So every time you are thrown back on yourself and every time you are thrown back on that blank page. And so there's two things I would say. One is take it off the computer because mm -hmm. I think that that weird white light glaring at you is not helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that our minds, and all the more in these times, are not linear. Your mind does not go like this. It does not write, I mean, it does not think like that. So when I take things off the page to, whether it's to generate, to problem solve, mm -hmm. to contemplate, I have, I use blank paper and I'm writing all over the paper, sometimes simultaneously. And for me, that is incredibly liberating. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, it also lets me, like, I can be writing, like, peanut butter, flowers, <laughs> taxes, and then I'm like, and then he said, I hate you, you know? <laughs> and she said, that's not true. Don't forget to call mom about the, you know, because it lets, because that is, my brain is shattered. 
And so that, that allows me, and in a way it sort of lowers the bar, it goes, there's nothing off limits here, and then I will take that and transcribe it. So there's that mm -hmm. piece of it. And then I'm trying to think the other thing I was gonna say. Oh, I know what it, I know what it was. You know, when 9-11 when happened, I remember this horrible, you know, bad times, um, watching that happen, but also thinking that I, until that moment, realized I depended on the world around me to be stable so that I could go into my imagination, because I really, I am a person who writes like truly made up shit, right? So if the world around you becomes de unstable or, or, or in peril, it is very hard, especially as someone who feels like in some ways our job is to bear witness, to look away and then go, and then he passed the flowers to the little girl who said, oh, thank you, and it was such a nice day in the war, and i see you again tomorrow, you know? <laughs> so there, there's that part, which I think is really, really difficult. And I think the first piece of it is just acknowledging it is really difficult, and that goes a little bit to the lowering the bar, and then realizing we are, we are witnesses to the time we live in, hmm. but we also have to live in the time we live in. So it's, it's okay to write something that's entertaining. It's okay to make somebody laugh. And I, I, in my own work, I'm always doing the thing where I make you laugh, then I really make you cry. <laughs> but because I feel like by, if I make you laugh, then I can get in deeper, you know? But that's a whole other department. And I, yeah, and I do think this book, because the people who were commissioned, everybody was writing these pieces, like literally the commissions went out right before the pandemic hit. So most of the pieces, you will feel the influence there, but it's interesting, but they're not all darkness, you know, like, like, like there, there's, I mean, definitely people are, you know, working through stuff as, you know, in these pieces, but there's also, there is a lot of humor. There is a lot of like, you know, takes from like way out here, you know, uh, in it that, um, that I think reflect all those things that, that you were just saying. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask one more question to the group, and then I think we'll turn it over to the audience. So get your questions ready. Have a contest <laughs> soon. Um, and Hannah, you have questions for the audience too, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> you guys get to work. Uh, so, so no, I just want to talk a little bit about because you know I'm you know I'm you know one of the reasons why we started one story um, was like I think there's something very special about the the experience of a short story because like you get to sit down and have a complete artistic yeah. experience in like you know, 10 to 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on the length of the story. And for a lot of these pieces are very short. So yeah. like really, you know, there, there is something really magical about that that is not done these right. days. So can you just talk a little bit about, you know, and the other thing that I think is so cool about this anthology is everybody is approaching these stories like from, like like some of them are you know translations of made up languages you know some of them are conversations you know some of them are a little bit more traditional some of them are you know just like doing all kinds of you know interesting things so so can you talk a little bit about like the short story form like what do you find joyful about it like why do you turn to it um, what do you think is great about short stories I could go on and on but I want to know what you guys think what do you think yeah. Why do you turn to a short story? Why do you write one? <laughs> yeah, I'm going first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, short stories are my first love, my you know, deepest love, I will say. I, I, I think I turn to the short story because I feel like in a short story, every moment matters. Yeah. And so, I don't know, our time in this world is limited. <laughs> And so when we're reading a story that's been so finely honed and crafted, it's a really intimate conversation with the writer who's revised it maybe a million times yeah. to get to those moments that are you know, deeply intimate between the reader. Whereas I think with novels, they can be a little bit more loosey-goosey, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> But the short story, you really have that expectation that every moment matters. And maybe that's, you know, sort of an anthem of how we live our lives. Right. I mean, I think um, um, my, my thesis advisor was Hajin, and he, he was always like, Waiki, a short story is art. A novel, eh. <laughs> You know, and, I, <laughs> and this is Hajin, and I thought, OK, great. Um, but I think one of the great things about short story, it's art, it's beautiful, everything that you said I agree with. But it's a problem I can keep in my head for, I can contain the entire story in my head. I can figure it out in my head. I can't do that with like a novella, a novel. It's just that, w it's just too much work for like, you know, one brain. But with a short story, I can kind of keep the characters, keep the story, the structure, and I'm sort of solving it. 
as I'm writing it. Um, and that's what sort of makes it like a great pearl because you're, you're able to sort of, I guess the Rubik's Cube, right? Like you're able to kind of figure it out um, with enough time. What is the best place to put this? What is the best place to put that? Um, and that, that's, that's just such the joy of the short story for me. I think, <laughs> um, well, a couple things. I mean, I think of the short story in some ways as, like often students, or people will ask, what's the difference between you write both? Why do you write some? And I would say mm. to me, the short story in part, there's, there are things and almost like intonation, sounds, points of view that would not only not be sustainable as a novel, I wouldn't want to spend 10 years, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 700 pieces of paper on them. Um, so that's part of it is it, it can be in some ways, it also has a kind of compression mm -hmm. and a kind of distillation. And I would say, whether we want to admit it or not, there is a greater attention to the language, to the word by word, and the relationship of line, you know, that we don't really have in the same way, usually in a novel. Um, a novel is a little bit like, and, and in the best of ways in a novel, you can let the kite string out and go like, look where it's going now. <laughs> oh, I made a left turn. <laughs> like in a short story, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just watch it happen. And part of a novel is, again, a kind of, it's, you're an observer a little bit more in a novel. Right. And in a story, I feel like it's a, you also actively participate in sort of putting those pieces together. Mm -hmm. you're, as you, you know, you're spinning the Rubik's Cube. Right. Yeah, yeah I think, and I think that's why it lends it so well to performances on stage, right? Because there is that compression yeah. and tightness to the language and, and you know, and propulsion, right. I would say. That's so great. Um, the lights have gone up, which means it is time for our game. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so what I'm going to do is everybody keep your hands down, and you're going to be the judge. Oh, no. And I'll go one, two, three, and first hand up can win the prize. You have to come up and then ask a question. So here we go, here we go. One, two, three. Oh. All right, I wow. think I'm going to call it the one in the, the closest to the back, black mask, and you're going to have a peace sign now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on up and ask your question. And, and I think it's the A and the copy that you've got. That's the oh, one yeah. you're going to get. Oh, yeah, this is the one you're going to get. Um, yeah. Was it touched by all? Yeah, touched by all. <laughs> yeah, touched by all, signed by all. Thank you. And everyone else who's interested in asking a question can form a line up the aisle. I'll, and I'll give gifts to those people, too. I have, I'm sure I have, I have some credit cards I can cancel in a week or so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my question is basically, <clears throat> when you're commissioned to do something specific, like a short story, uh, how do you sort which ideas are good for shorter pieces versus good for longer pieces ahead of time. Uh -huh. Because in my experience, it's very difficult to do that. Well, I'll say, and it's funny, because I almost was going to say this in, re in response to your question on short stories. For me, because I'm often, you know, you're working on a novel for a million years, or you're working on a book of stories. When you get an assignment or a commission or this thing, it's a little bit like a writing exercise. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, mm -hmm. it forces you to do something you weren't going to do. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it also frees you to do that thing. So I think it lets, for me, it lets me play and take a risk and do something that I wasn't already thinking I was going to do. So it, in that sense, I would say it's actually very liberating. And I think in this lovely book you're about to receive, yes. you will see uh, and feel the liberation that uh, wow, that these 35 is. writers felt. So just step right up as these people answer your question. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Like, I, I had to write a piece for, um, for, for a collection that was being put together by Akashic, and, like, the, the theme was, like, smoking. So, yeah. so, so it, was, it, was about, it was about cigarettes. So, like, cigarettes had to, like, and smoking, the actor smoking had to, like, and I was like, what am I going to, like, I don't smoke. I don't How am I going to do this? But it was actually, but it was kind of fun because then it, it actually opened me up and forced me to, like, get outside of where I would normally go. I don't know if you feel the same way about getting Not a really. commission. Writing exercise, trying something different. I think with a novel you're dealing, you know, I mean, I'm going to quote Hodgin again because he's just so <laughs> quotable. He's like, a novel is 30 events, a story collection, or story is like five events or something like that. So like I think with a novel you need like almost 30 big things to kind of like think about and swirl around in your head. And with, you know, with like a smaller thing, you can kind of like play with two or three things, it's like juggling. And it's a little bit more fun because it can be a little bit more random. It doesn't have to be perfectly outlined or kind of put together. Um, and there's like a messiness there, but then like you said, this compression, so. Yeah. Any thoughts, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I mean, experimentation. Yeah. I keep thinking about the wedding cake. Uh, oh. do, do, you, do you remember this collection? There was a collection of stories about 
by fiction writers like Richard Bausch and other people, like where you had to write about a wedding cake. <laughs> oh my and God. The story, you know, it was like commi- everyone was commissioned to write about a wedding cake. And I guess like that sort of applies to mm. any time you're doing it, which is like you're kind of going to have to like jump out of your comfort zone a little bit. And right. I think that's really fun. There you go. There you go. Enjoy the book. Enjoy the Brick Prize winner. All right, people, runners up, come and ask your questions, please. I know there were other hands up, so there are other questions in the audience. Don't be shy. Should we get out this card? Should we get out press? I could give you my dry cleaning. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want to give another? It'll be another one. Can we give give these prizes? I have. uh, Are you going to give your? Oh, wait, I can't give mine, but. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, what was your question? Uh, yeah. So my question, on the question is... question. Let's think about it. <laughs> uh, my question is, when you're starting off with a concept, and maybe this isn't true for your particular writing styles, but when you're starting off with a larger idea, what path do you particularly take to get down to dialogue? Oh, dialogue. Hmm. Huh. Well, just because you asked it in that way, <laughs> I'm going to say I would start with dialogue. Because it sounds, if I was your therapist, which I'm not yet, but I I (laughs) give you my card. Um, It sounds like dialogue might feel like it's a difficult thing for you. And for some people, it is. So the things that I think about dialogue are, and this is is true, I am making it up, but I've said it before, so it counts. Um, I think of dialogue as a little bit like Wordle or double word score and Scrabble. So what can I use, what can I say where I'm not hitting the thing too hard on the head, but I'm also revealing something about character. So if I start off something and go, you jerk, then you automatically have an intonation, you have a sense of something happening, or you can start it with, I love you, or these are beautiful flowers. But immediately we hear something and we know something. So I would say, don't be afraid of dialogue. Uh, One of my students said to me the other day, how do I do dialogue? And I thought, have you ever read anything? (laughs) 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 They're like, what should it look like? And I thought, same as everything else, with maybe a couple of the doohickeys on the side. So I would, in all seriousness, I think thinking about, and also thinking, I would say, like, why, are, why does this person want to be in my story? Or if they don't maybe want to, that's useful information. Why do they need to be in the story? And what, are, what, are they, what sort of are they looking at themselves, which can be different than what you as the writer are looking at, and you, the reader? So asking questions would be my thing. That was good. And wait, I do have a prize for you, which is oh, a look, bookmark. Look See, okay, I did bookmark. have something. Oh, yes. Yeah, here we go. These are special limited oh, bookmarks. bookmarks. All right. Oh, bookmark. Um, here we go. Enjoy. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? I have a thought, but yeah. you guys go. Oh, okay. You're um, the guests. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I feel like scenes in general are these moments where I'm completely surprised. I don't know what's going to happen in a scene, whereas in exposition or when I'm in summary time, I have a much more greater sense of authorial control. And I feel like the dialogue is the extreme version of agency for the character and surprise for the writer. So I feel like you know when you want to be surprised, when you want your characters to have more agency, maybe that's a good moment to step into the dialogue. Yeah, and just like you know, putting a dialogue like introducing. You could, you could just do it sort of like a very exercise, introduce the character, what they look like, you know, driver's license, description, and then like what they sound like, and then just delete all the description. And then it kind of, you start with dialogue, you have dialogue, and you don't have all the other stuff. So I sometimes think when I'm introducing a character, I do a lot more exposition, and then I just delete most of the exposition. It kind of feeds into this direct dialogue and then indirect dialogue. and sort of varying it that way. But dialogue can be a lot of fun because it accelerates the reading sense of the spacing of the white space, right? So um, when when characters are fighting, I do a lot of dialogue because, you know, everyone wants to hear what you guys are yelling at about, you know? And so, like, when they're just talking about something boring, maybe we don't do dialogue. We just speed it up. So I think you go into dialogue when it's, like, highly tense. Someone's saying something pretty mean but funny. <laughs> and so you put that into dialogue. Um, and there's, like, a little bit of, like, fun to that with, with you know, speeding up the conversation. Anna, say, we want to hear what you have to yeah. say. Oh, I'll just add that, like, I think there's, I feel like I come at dialogue from two directions. And one, one is actually, if I'm, if I'm approaching it, like, um, there's a writing exercise that I do with my students that actually works every time. So I'm going to give it to you because it's, it's <laughs> great. So, so it's about starting, actually, with a very banal line of mm-hmm. dialogue. Um, so, so the setting that I give my students is, like, it's a wedding. Um, I want you to just think of like any character. They don't have a name. They don't have a name. So mm-hmm. it's just like like a basic person that would be at a wedding. So that could be caterer, you know, mm-hmm. you know, bride, um, 
you know, groom, uh, mother of the bride, bridesmaid, you know, DJ, whoever, right? And then like the first thing I was like, I was like, now write down a line, line of dialogue that that person is saying. So it could be as simple as like, I do. Or it could be as simple as like, it's time to do the hokey pokey or whatever <laughs> the person is saying. Like any basic line that we all know the lines. We've all been to at least one wedding. Um, and then it's like, then I call it, then what we do is that, that consider that like the topsoil and then we go down. So the first thing is you take that line of dialogue and it's like while they are saying that, what are they physically doing? So you add a physical motion to attach to that. So I'm saying it's time to do the hokey pokey and I'm like, what is that person doing? It's the DJ, they're flipping the light switch on and off because and then because they can't afford a strobe light. All right. It's time to do the hokey pokey. All right. So then then you then like, well, they are they're saying that, they're doing that, um, well, they are thinking what? So then you go a little bit, so, so he's, you know, he's flipping lights, which on the it's time to do the hokey pokey. He's thinking about the guy he slept with last night. Okay. So then the, the, so that's the third layer. And then the fourth layer is you, you add a memory. Mm. So it's basically a, a thought, but something that's much deeper. So, um, so the memory would be, and again, you, you do this very, very quickly. So it's just, it's about like getting into the randomness of it. So the memory would be, um, the memory of going fishing with his father who has died. Right. So I go from it's time to do the hokey pokey or suddenly I'm at this like dead father fishing trip. Right. So it's like it's very fast. So it's like this weird tunneling down that ends up being sort of a way to, to, to actually get into a whole story. And then I say the second way approaching dialogue, I feel like is is a little bit different because then the dialogue is coming in actually as a, like a super compressed bouillon cube of, <laughs> of, of something because because I feel like I feel like the, a lot of times like the first draft there's a lot of back and forth dialogue like I don't know what are you saying blah 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 and then you take it and it's all about shrinking it down yeah. take take the soup and make it a bouillon cube that's my advice for dialogue well and, and along that line I'd say read plays um, because mm. if you look you know that that's where the dialogue is. Yeah, read a Martin McDonough play. Yeah, and or a Harold will, Pinter play. Exactly. Yeah. So That's all bullion. So it's all bullion. <laughs> it's all good. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for the Thank question. You That's a good question. Um, I think we have one time for maybe one more question. There was another. There hand. was another hand, hand up. up. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, in the front. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so. Oh, sorry. This has been amazing. My question is about. Um, short stories as an excerpt from a larger project or novel. And I would just yeah. love to know how each of you have approached that in your work, and also if Selected Shorts has ever excerpted um, mm. a novel. I know that they have. Yeah. Um, I know that they have, because they did, um, well, I went to like the Murakami, right? Jennifer, Jennifer can answer that question. What are some other novels you guys have done lately? That's, Have any of you done that, published a, a part of a novel as a short story? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've, done, I've done that. Yeah, totally, I've done that. Yeah. Um, but the other thing, the other problem I've had is, is twice now I've done something that I really philosophically don't believe in, which is I've had a short story that became a novel. And I don't think that's OK, because I don't think they're the same thing. But one of them. I was writing for something, and then I thought I was done, and then it just kept going, and I'm like, what's happening? And the rest of people were like, I'm not telling you. And I'm like, at some point, you're gonna have to fill me in. <laughs> it's like, you're taking a lot of my time, I know, so whatever. So um, music for torching was not supposed to be that, and another one, maybe we'd be, for, I don't know, what, uh, oh, maybe we'd be forgiven, starts off, and it's like, the problem too, if, if you have something that you think is a short story, and it ends like, like <laughs> with a, a, a man killing his wife or something, mm -hmm. And that's page 30. It's very hard to go on from that for another 400 pages, right? Yeah. So there's that part. And then there also are times I've absolutely excerpted from within a novel made. You know, because the p thing, too, is before your book comes out, you want to try to get little snippets out there. So yeah, always. I, I, I will just say, as an editor, um, I think it depends on the piece. Like, and it depends on, on, the, on, the, on the novel. And like, we have published a one story a couple pieces that were actually parts of novels. But usually what we do, uh, and you know, and this is what I suggest, and this is what I've done with my own work, is actually you can, like, things don't have to be always one version. 
Like you can have five different versions of something, right? So, so what I would do is um, for my pieces that have been excerpted from novels, that like I basically have written, taken them and like rewritten them, and made them a standalone piece. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so, it's, so, it's, so there's ways to do it if the pacing is right, and if it, you yeah. know, and if it does sort of like you know, you you basically fix the you you remove things that you know have to deal with the larger narrative, and then you you cut characters and you kind of shape it into its own thing. So, yeah. So take if you are working on a longer piece with but would like to submit some of them as stories, think about taking some of those chapters and like how would this stand alone so that someone wouldn't need the context of the rest of it. I bet you can do it. Yeah, and I think that's very important because it's it's very very rare that you can truly lift something intact out of a much longer work and, and, and use it as is without reframing it or sort of bending it in some way. Yeah, I can't tell you, I mean, we've been doing yeah. one story for almost 20 years yeah. and I will tell you, like, there's so many times where I'm reading a submission and I'm like, this is a novel. Yeah. yeah. It's not well, a story. Like, well, it's the got the, 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 the feeling is different. The sometimes excerpts and they have, yeah. you know, if you read their stories, they never tell you it's an excerpt, right? Because they're like, don't want to do that. But then... <laughs> They did that for The Idiot, that book, and it was yeah. called Constructed Worlds, and it was like the first 10 pages and then the last two paragraphs of the book. Because I read the entire book and I was like so interested in the story. And I was like, how did, you know, that's kind of like, it's just, it's just butchering. It's sort of like putting things together. And that was something that like one of my teachers said was like, Marky, if you, if you want to prolong it, just like cut the ending off and put something in the middle and then put the ending somewhere else. And then I think that's something that people do when they exit, right? Like there's chop yes. off the end and then bring it up. All kinds um, of things. Yeah, yeah. You know, your work is malleable. Yeah. So like, yeah. keep it malleable yeah. and like change it, change it up as 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 you see fit. But yeah, you but you might have to do a different version. Right. Yeah. Um, I think we might be at time. Yeah. Yes, we are at time. I don't know, over to, but um, you know, this was this was. I, I guess I'm going to close with just like a tiny, tiny little anecdote before you come on stage. Yeah. Um, which for me is like is, is meaningful and one of the reasons why I got involved with Selected Shorts in the first place. So I want to encourage everybody, if you have not heard Selected Shorts, mm -hmm. um, you can, you know, you can listen to the podcast, you can listen to WMYC, you can, you can, you can, you know, go to your local radio station and, and check it out. Um, you can visit Symphony Space and go to one of the performances. Um, for me, um, <laughs> Selected Shorts came into my life at a time when I was like really struggling. I was like uh, just out of school. I was working three jobs and um, Selected Shorts came on the radio in the hour that it took me to drive from like my cashier job to my waitressing job. And it was like, it was like from 5 to 6 p.m. on Saturdays or something. And I remember I would like get in my junked out like falling apart car and I would drive from my, and, and, and for me listening to Selected Shorts was like a lifeline to the life that I hoped that one day I would live to be involved in literature to be like to be living in New York City which I'm very happy to be here and be with all of you tonight to be a part of that so for me like Selected Shorts was like this meaningful connection um, to this literary world, to these, you know, to these literary stories, to the audience, you know, even though I was listening on the radio, I could hear the audience gasping and like reacting to everything, and it just felt so powerful. Like there's something, there's like this power to stories. Um, you know, there's this like, the, like my favorite quote or, or blurb that we got for the book, which is like, "Stories will save us." Mm -hmm. and I think that's really, you know, that's really key. I think that's something to you know keep in mind as we continue to face these these difficult times. I think it's like the Metropolitan Opera for literature. Yeah, it really, is. it is. It's like you know that, that, that uh, the Metropolitan Opera is a Texaco Opera broadcast. Yeah. It's incredible, and and testament to the folks from from Symphony Space who are here and the incredible work uh -huh. you did because. Yeah. People do listen to it all over the world, and all, you'll get like a weird random email, like I heard you on Selected Shorts, I'm thinking, five years ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but it, it is really, really interesting and important. And, and here, the other really important thing, and I made my students do this all the more during the pandemic, hearing short stories. You don't have to be looking at paper, at words, at screens all the time. Mm. Just listening, just sitting there, closing your eyes or not as a therapist would say, <laughs> um, whenever you feel comfortable. And taking that in is really, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend it. Mm. Yeah, so, so thank you all for contributing to this of and for you know, celebrating um, the publication of this book. Um, and we're just you know, really happy to have done this tonight at um, Center for Fiction. Th th thank you guys for having us here. Thanks. Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> thank you, Hannah. <laughs> yes.